Hi everyone, I'm Jan Richard-Doms, the Vice President of U.S. Development with Join Me Shan. We are an ecosystem of brands for women, by women, connecting women to each other and to the companies, causes, and organizations that champion equity for women professionally and personally. You're here with us today watching our diversity, equity, and inclusion show brought to you each and every Thursday. Please make sure to join our YouTube channel, Join Me Shad, to stay up to date with all of our content. And check us out at joinmeshad.com to learn more about how you too can become a member of how together we revolutionize the way that professional women connect, engage, and do business together. I am thrilled and honored to share the stage today with Nancy Dadia. Hi, Nancy. Welcome. Hi, Jan. Thank you. It's uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today with you. Oh, thank you. I feel I feel the same. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. Nancy is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Beringer Ingelheim. Nancy, I love so much about the work that you do and your brand and the story behind the brand. Share with us a bit about your background and what led you to become really passionate about the work that you do in the DEI space. Well, uh, so, you know, it, it's not one of those things when you're five years old, you grow up and say, I want to be a chief diversity and inclusion. <laughs> um, I don't even think that profession existed, although I am, you know, a child, I'm dating myself now, of the 60s. And it's, it's really ironic to, to think about, um, you know, it was the era of uh, civil rights and Martin Luther King. And um, I remember, you know, coming home uh, the day after Martin Luther King was shot. And we talked about that in school. And my father was, you know, very traditional man um, and of Italian heritage. And uh, he would say, uh, you know, what did you do in school today? And I said, we sang, we shall overcome. And, you know, that we will, you know, I'm product of the New York City school systems. We were and still are very progressive. And I really, I have to admit, at very early stages in my life, I had uh, uh, a concern for the underdog. And because my father was so much of an extreme resistor, um, I think he led me to do this work. Uh, because much of my life was in opposition politically um, and socially of his views. Uh, so uh, fast forward, I spent the majority of my career in financial services, working for a major New York City-based financial institution. Uh, I'm very proud of spending more than 25 years uh, there. After about the fourth merger, I decided it was time to moved to phase two of my career, which was really embracing my executive coaching aspects, but being in a situation where I could make a difference uh, or feel like I was influencing change. Uh, it was also a very interesting personal change for me. I had just recovered from breast cancer. And when you have some sort of life-threatening illness, it really changes your view on what really matters. And what really mattered for me was me. <laughs> uh, for the first time, uh, I, I, I really wanted to do something that made me feel better. Uh, and so I got into this work and it, it seemed to be a natural fit to go into um, healthcare, uh, given where I was and my connection with the patient and uh, the importance of listening to the patient because I know what that felt like. Uh, so I had an opportunity to uh, consult with uh, Beringer Ingelheim, which ultimately led to a full-time role in helping me, uh, helping them to form a diversity and inclusion strategy 15 years ago. So here I am 15 years later, um, as proud as I could be, thinking that I would only be there five years and then move on, because now in my career, I'm called a tree hugger. You know, I've been with the company <laughs> for a long time and I won't let go. Uh, but I I think that speaks volumes. And we'll get into that more um, of what a great company bearing or Ingelheim is and why I've stayed uh, as long as I have. So that was kind of a, a step, a very quick stepping stone. It did start at an early age. You know, I think I think it's so interesting because it may shed a lot. We talk about the the value of the personal story, the personal narrative, and I think that for many women, 
as we move forward into our careers, particularly as we reach the senior levels, we sometimes forget that we're this wonderful sum of all of our parts. <laughs> and, you know, really what led us to where we are today is really a reflection on, you know, the way in which we interacted with our family members at an early age to what we really dreamt and aspired about them, even if those plans change along the way. Like, how as women are we very incredibly resilient, right? And thinking through, like, how do we take what life throws at us right now and learn from that and then incorporate that either consciously or subconsciously into how we think about, you know, how we serve others and how we serve ourselves. I love what you said around, you know, this is a moment in time where you thought about, you know, what do I want to do for myself? which I think is an important for, you know, for many of us who are watching the show today to particularly right now in this moment in time too, to really step back and reflect like that. And yeah. Th and thanks for acknowledging that. I'm always reminded I, I was a frequent traveler pre COVID and um, it, you know, with all the flights I've been on around the world, I'm always reminded of the flight attendants uh, safety message, right? Which is, uh, before you can help others, you need to put your own oxygen mask on. And I think, you know, many of us are burning the candle at both ends, more so now than ever in this blurred world uh, that we're living in. And um, I think we're running from meeting to meeting, Zooming our way through life. Um, and we shouldn't stop uh, smelling the flowers, right? And And reflecting on whatever it is that you know, inspires you, a sunrise, a sunset, a walk in the park. That's so important for my well-being and because my peace of mind right now is not in its best place. That's so important. And the metaphor around putting your mask on first before you put, you know, put the, the mask on of those who's sitting next to you is so, so very vibrant and so powerful, particularly as we think about, you know, even the way in which right now we talk about COVID, right? And we talk about, you know, how we protect ourselves to protect others and how we wear a mask, for example, to protect others around, around us and thinking about, thinking about this world not as, you know, me solo, but then complicating to that, how do I take care of myself to ensure I'm taking care of my community? Exactly. Uh, and, and I think the more we are selfless and, um, you know, more uh, concerned about the impact that we have on others, um, the better we'll be able to um, at least keep ourselves healthier. Yeah. I want to talk a bit about um, you being a best place to work. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, your company year after year after year, I think you've been on the Working Mother Media's best places for working moms to work for what, at least eight years, if not more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> in addition to many, many other lists that celebrate people with disabilities, celebrate um, diversity, equity, inclusion in the broader sense, um, celebrate LGBTQ individuals working within your company. Um, talk to us a bit about, for you personally, who you are as a human being at your core. Why is it so important to work with and be affiliated with a company who tremendously, obviously, cares so much about diversity, inclusion, and, um, and gender, race, and class? Yeah, okay. thanks for that question, because, um, you know, a lot of chief diversity officers, um, not a lot, but, but many people want to get the awards just for the sake of getting the awards. Not unlike, you know, kind of throwing money at a cause just because you can or you're able to. For me, um, those awards have served as not a pounding of our chest, we deserve them, uh, but more, let's see where we're at and what we need to do. <clears throat> and they've served as barometers and uh, checkpoints for us to say, we're not where we need to be. And we need to be better at doing this. And if we are going to embrace this mindset of inclusion or that sense of belonging, where you can show up and be your authentic self, then we have to we have to mirror, uh, we have to practice what we are saying and mean it. So every one of the pieces of recognition that we have uh, received, we have earned. Uh, we have not paid to play, uh, and we refuse to pay to play. Uh, so what we submit and all of the recognition that we have, we don't have to pay to win. Um, and that I think is a big difference about the eye. The other 
The other wonderful aspect of Baring or Ingelheim is that we're family owned and you do feel like part of the family, despite being 50,000 employees. When I go to uh, different parts of the world, it, it's uh, aside from the culture, you're part of the family, you know, especially um, in our larger countries like the U.S., Germany, China and Japan. There's um, that sense of going home whenever you go to another uh, site to visit. So I think the awards um, and the recognition for me personally, um, and I identify as uh, a lesbian, uh, female, obviously. Um, and for me, it wasn't just about equal rights. It, it was more about equitable solutions. Um, and part of that even goes before laws were put in place, we as a company were always ahead of the government um, in in terms of our offerings. And, you know, the federal government has been slower than corporate corporations and corporations have led the way with progressiveness in terms of benefits and offerings. And the third part is that the definition of family is very different. Uh, and it's not just your traditional cisgender binary family anymore. And we needed to look much more deeply around the types of total rewards we were looking at. Um, and we had to change with the times because the workforce was is changing and was changing. And if we didn't do that, we would uh, lose incredible talent to uh, our competition and we don't want to do that. We, it's not that, you know, um, it's not that we don't want people to stay with us a long time. Uh, you know, don't, I don't want to come across that way. We want people to feel that they're growing and that they have uh, the opportunity to thrive, um, even as the world shifts. But um, that doesn't mean they have to stay in the same role for 30 years. Yes, I want to go back to the the, the notion of the, the family-focused, family-oriented culture by which the company grew to a 50,000-plus employee organization. I think there's so much that companies can learn from really understanding what does that mean at a granular level of detail, right? And no matter what size a company is, but you know, we know watching today, we have a mix of female corporate executives, entrepreneurs, business owners, and many women in the audience who are really thinking about, you know, how do I use this time to stay fresh and relevant and current in my career? And so the reason why I ask this is that I think that there's something so rich about the history and heritage of your brand that remains true to the core fabric and core root of, of who the company is, right? If the company were a person, who the company is, right? Um, what should we learn from that? Like from that experience of having that, that the family focus, like I love what you said around, you know, it feels like we go home. Like each time I travel, I felt like I was going home. What does that mean? And what does that look like in the sense of then how does that play out for, um, for how people grow at BI? Well, the, the one part that I think is such a um, apropos or appropriate example is the way we handled COVID. Um, and I think the most important part was safety of our employees was paramount. Uh, and it was really, we all felt that it, it, it was the same way, you know, we, we affectionately say that, that bearing our Ingelheim is paternalistic, you know, it, it's like the big father, uh, and the care the, the bearing her family is very charitable, uh, overall, and they truly care about the well-being of all of us. So we rest assured knowing that what they were doing, keeping us out of work um, and giving us the time to um, uh, continue to perform, albeit virtually, um, and check in with us to see how we were doing. Literally through you know, videos, um, voices coming from the, the board of managing directors that were genuine and hearing them say, I'm having a hard time too. And, you know, I'm worried about my family. They, they really showed um, the true sense of human, uh, humanistic 
approach. They always have, but it was amplified more during COVID. And there was sensitivity and um, understanding around the need for empathy for, um, you know, for working parents, for others who are alone, perhaps taking care of uh, sick relatives or, or loved ones, um, was really uh, very generous in terms of time off and extending pay, um, you know, for people. Uh, we did not have to um, eliminate any jobs um, at all based on, on COVID. So I think that the, the sense that we come first uh, was very clear to us and they didn't have to say it. Their actions um, and our actions as leaders speak louder than the words. That's so showing, showing that, right? Showing that that care and concern was palpable. I think that that's remarkable. I mean, number one, congratulations for not furloughing or laying anybody off during this time period. That is remarkable. Um, number one. Number two, um, you know, it's so interesting to hear you say that there were, you know, people in leadership, senior leadership positions that admitted to being afraid or admitted to being scared. I think that speaks volumes just in the sense of the, the willingness of management to be vulnerable and to actually, how do I want to say this? I feel like often we coach leaders to be strong during times of crisis and we coach them to be charismatic leaders during times of crisis. Right. But this is a whole different level of crisis that really has rocked every aspect of our lives from you and I are having conversations in our homes today, right? Like when would that have happened in the past? <laughs> right? Like you're seeing into my home, you're seeing, I'm seeing into yours, you're seeing into mine. Um, and, you know, we were interviewing someone else a couple of weeks ago and she said, look like, you know, now we consider each of our employees having granted us permission to be in their homes with them, right? Because how often, you know, it's, it, I guess my point is, is that this is just so different in the sense of how employees relate to this experience and to humanize the experience at all different levels of management so that everyone feels like they're kind of in it together. Although we know that COVID has, I mean, that brings up a whole different set of conversations, a whole different set of issues around the inequality of COVID. Right. But just from the corporate culture perspective, having a sense that you're not suffering or not feeling stress and anxiety in it alone, because we're all also going through this at different moments in different ways too over the last Absolutely. Time. And we, we've made, um, there, there were a couple of things that we also did differently uh, that also um, I was able to take all the way up to the board of managing directors in Germany, uh, which was um, a web, uh, a virtual webinar or workshop that uh, I co-created with several of my colleagues called Navigating Through Uncertainty and Ambiguity. And it was really, uh, it was somewhat structured, but it was more of uh, an opportunity for employees to express how they were feeling, um, to talk about the uncertainty, the fear, the concern, and for us affirming you know, what they were going through. Fast forward, right, to Memorial Day weekend after the George Floyd uh, killing, we began to introduce um, courageous conversations. And that was truly based on the company introducing an upstander mindset and basically denouncing all forms of discrimination, uh, any type of harassment, racism of any sort. And we created eight, we've had since um, the first week in June, 18 sessions with uh, approximately 1,800 employees that have enrolled to participate. Now, these are very unstructured, structured sessions. Uh -huh. So we essentially start with a moment of silence, a few ground rules. Um, this is not to talk about politics or you know, condemn any one group. It's a forum uh, where we want you to express and tell us how you're feeling. I, I can't tell you, and, I, and we did that because we, not because it was the right thing to do, it was necessary because employees were just feeling so dragged down, not only with COVID, but what was happening in the world, especially our BIPOC employees, the Black, Indigenous, 
people of color uh, and also the um, empathy from our white colleagues, right, and, and wanting to do more. So the fact that the company took action and, it, you know, I did it on my own um, and they supported that and I co-facilitated with a leader, I personally was sitting there with my boss and with, you know, the uh, other senior leaders, and we were struck by the stories. Uh, I mean, I, I I had to, I had a hard time holding it together. And I have to tell you, it was the quiver lip and um, I'd walk away. And I, you know, even, even now when I think about it, I, I get choked up and I'm still doing these. Um, and I'll continue to do them through the end of the year. But that space really, uh, our, our employees just cannot believe that they're able to talk about this. And I think that's a differentiator. A, a lot of other companies are farming it out to consultants. Um, and, and no, you know, that I don't mean that in a critical way. But when they see leaders wanting to hear, and it's not a consultant and the chief diversity officer is at the table with them, they really feel heard, valued, and respected, which to me are the, the real essentials of a culture of belonging. Do you think this also gets to the heart of the matter why some, for some companies, DEI initiatives haven't been as successful as what they originally intended to be? From the perspective of, you know, we work with many companies that we take them from moving, moving kind of checking things off of a box to really right. infusing them into overall, overall arching business strategies. Um, and, you know, your point is very, very valid around, you know, the moments and times where that work can be done in-house, where employees are able to have a different sort of relationship with, with other team members, I think is incredibly valuable because then it, it gives light and importance to the fact that this isn't just an initiative that we've implemented to check off the box, but it really truly is implement integrated into, you know, the work that we do to ensure, you know, healthy and, and positive ROIs at the end of the day. Exactly. You talk about um, three dimensions of inclusion, which I think are incredibly interesting. And I know that these have evolved. So I would love for you to tell us the ways in which they've evolved, but three original inclusion, dimensions of inclusion being gender, geography, and generation. Mm. Nancy would love your thoughts on the, the original thought process behind those three in particular, and then talk to us about how that's evolved just most recently. Sure, thank you. Uh, so uh, these uh, three Gs, uh, if you will, originated uh, from our global headquarters uh, as we look at uh, the global footprint of VI. And the three key areas of attention that we really wanted to embrace was the uh, shift in the workforce and the uh, changing demographics of, you know, baby boomers retiring um, and we're coming up retirement age and looking at um, the composition of our workforce and the majority of leaders tended to not be millennials, but to be more Gen X baby boomers. So trying to say that those folks aren't gonna be here for years, we need to um, shift that flow a little bit and start planning for the future. The geography part is that in many of uh, the countries outside of the United States, uh, we have a lot of homogeneity, right? Um, so in Europe, you're going to have a lot of Europeans. Um, in Germany, you're going to be predominantly uh, staffed by Germans, right? Uh, in France, you're going to have more French people. Um, and what we wanted to look at, which is where geography came into play, is are we pulling talent from different parts of the world with multicultural backgrounds, or are we staying in that same zone where we're not getting diversity? And then, of course, the obvious, right, women um, and women uh, in general is, uh, you know, the composition of the workforce being more than half women. And yet when we look at the top of the house, it's not half women. Uh, and so we have to think about that more broadly. So in, in the U.S., we did not embrace the three G's per se. 
we looked, uh, we're looking at what I consider, um, and I affectionately refer to them as the five magicals, right? The five magical areas that we need to focus on. And the first one is equity in every sense of the word, right? Um, and, and what I mean by that is not just your compensation and pay equity, but, you know, are you um, getting enough opportunity to grow in advance? So are we being uh, equitable, not necessarily equal, right? Two different things. Are we being equitable across the board? The second is um, our recruitment strategies and the way in which we're recruiting. Are we are we going to the same people? Are we hiring new people that go back to their old companies and bring in more of the same? Uh, we need to short circuit that. So having a look at all those processes and examining where there are opportunities to short circuit them and take the inherent or systemic um, bias that could be unintentionally in there, but shake that up. The third is what I call renewing your vows, you know, with the company. So it's the retention part. Do you, you know, if you're in a relationship of any sort, you know, maybe at a milestone in your relationship, like, do we still want to stay together? Do, you know, do we still want to stay however we define our togetherness, right? I think it's the same thing for an employee at a certain point in their career to say, is this still the company I want to be with? Do I still have that sense of purpose? So retention um, and helping employees to redefine their new why at different points in their life. And that could be around life changes. The fourth is around advancement. And am I feeling that I'm getting the attention that I need to advance? Do I have that relationship capital to grow and develop the same way that Jan does? Uh, Jan gets all the plum assignments, Nancy doesn't, right? Uh, so am I feeling equitable? feeling that I'm being equitably treated. And then um, not certainly last but not least is our representation of the workforce. Is it representative of the markets we serve? Um, is it representative of how the population is shifting? Um, and we have work to do in those five magicals. And I tell businesses that if you focus on one of those, even one, you don't have to do all five, pick one, you're going to make a difference. So um, we focus uh, around a framework that um, inserts those five magicals into an overarching talent growth and development, culture, equity, and employee engagement. Um, the third is really workforce reputation and our overarching framework is the company reputation, which you uh, so astutely pointed out. We feel that the reputation will follow if we get the other three right. <laughs> and it has. It, it, um, we have a, uh, I'm proud to say, a very good reputation in the, in the uh, marketplace. Nancy, in what ways has COVID shifted any parts of what you just said in the sense of um, what aha moments have you had that have been really surprising to you in how COVID shaped and changed perhaps some of this, if any of it? Well, I, I think it's changed some of the minds of leaders uh, who have been resistant to uh, somewhat more permanent flexibility uh, or more permanent um, remote uh, working. I mean, we were a company of frequent flyers, right? Uh, we were all over the world um, because we thought we had to be. Uh, and I think this aha moment has been that hmm, we've been able to do business quite successfully to uh, we have not lost momentum on projects. Uh, so I think the digital um, divide that used to be or no, you can't do that in person. Uh, you can't do that on camera. You need to be in person. We've taken a, a step back to revisit that. So globally across the world, we're rethinking that model. So I think that was not only um, an eye-opening moment for our board, but for all of our leaders to say, 
flexibility is the path forward. And um, that doesn't mean that all of us will be remote workers, but that um, we don't always all have to be on site at the same time. I yeah. think that's the biggest the biggest aha moment. It's so interesting. I think that's so true and, and really echoes what we've been having in many of our conversations just around, and we know there, there are pluses and, and minuses to this too. We know that the average workday has increased from eight hours a day to 11 hours a day. Largely because we're not commuting, and you know the digital devices go with us anywhere now because they're so portable, right. <laughs> for better or for worse, right? And we knew even before COVID that there were dangers around, um, you know, <laughs> all of the addictions that we had to our technology devices, right? And so, what does that mean in the sense of for people in roles like what you hold to ensure that? you're giving employees what they need to feel connected, engaged, inspired, a part of a community, part of the family, right, to your point, but then also that they have time to check out when they feel like they need to practice self-care. How has BI managed kind of that really challenging, kind of tricky, complex nature of how we think about life and work right now? Yeah, uh, thank you for, for that question. We, we really are committed to energy. <laughs> And we, we have encouraged through our open forums and town halls the need for people to take PTO, pay time off, right, or vacation time. And a lot of the pushback from employees uh, initially was, where am I going to go? I mean, why can't <laughs> I take time? And we would say to them, believe us that just being away from your computer for a day will make a difference, spend the day not working. Um, and it took us probably two or three attempts to get employees to see the value in doing that um, because the nature of which our uh, pay time off is structured is if you don't take it, you use it or lose it, right? It doesn't carry over. It, there's no end of the year, it just builds. So the more you use, the more you get. Um, and, and so having leaders model that behavior also helped. So when the president took three weeks to go to Maine with his family, people took time off, you know, and we, we pretty much mirror a European style mindset. So the summer is when the majority of our people take vacation and usually toward the end of the year. So July and August, August is the biggest vacation time. Um, we had a lot of folks take some time off. So I think it was helping to remind people of the value of renewing your energy. And we also encourage that during the day. We'll tell people to uh, block time and go for a walk uh, or play with their children, their pets, what, what else, whatever, go read a book, you know, get away from the computer. We, we were also very concerned um, about the impact of people being home and not getting the exercise. Um, and so we introduced a lot of wellness programs online as well. Um, you know, we used to have uh, online fitness centers, um, on-site fitness centers at our large campuses. So then we converted those into video sessions. So we kept wellness very much top of mind. Um, and then, you know, the need for support uh, with employee assistance um, also has increased for all the right reasons. And we reminded um, people of that support and that um, we've ramped it up more so now than ever because there's so much need. Uh, as you talked about it, right, that intersection of work and home um, and not just sharing uh, bandwidth, but sharing the kitchen, right? <laughs> having five <laughs> at mealtime all at once is, is a change for many people. Uh, so dealing with that and then dealing, uh, unfortunately, women feel that sense of responsibility. You know, they're the chief operating officer of their household. They're the chief medical officer. If somebody gets sick, they're the chief financial officer, right? So women carry this burden of uh, being the uh, chief uh, of the household. And I think that um, more so than ever, it has made life even more exhausting. Um, 
for for parents uh, and just for people who are home more, whether you're a parent or not. Um, it's a whole different level of responsibility to yourself and your household than you've had before. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I see the sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm listening to you talk and I can't help but wonder. So, you know, as companies continue to evolve how they think about recruiting and retaining top talent, right? And and knowing that, you know, in the old days, right, the fringe, be- fringe benefits package was largely a part of how a potential new hire may assess one job offer over another, right. in addition to salary and, you know, many of the other things that you've that you mentioned as well, but I'm wondering, you know, now that remote work is more of a thing, at least for the immediate near future, if not longer term near future, um, will companies need to think through their fringe benefits packages differently and not just incorporate in many of the things that you've already mentioned in the sense of, I love the honest conversations and I love the way in which your company is bringing, bringing groups of people together to have, to have those meaningful insightful humanistic approaches to check-ins um but are there other ways that companies are really going to have to think outside the box in the sense of becoming much more humanistic and much more uh, i guess you know in a way better listeners to really understand not just what employees think that they want but truly what they what they need because we know that companies will often offer extravagant benefits but the utilization rates may be very low Right. And so, sure, you can have an on, on-site yoga studio, a dry cleaner, babysitter, um, spa, et cetera, et cetera. But utilization rates of those may have been low in the past, but they're, you know, they're not existent now. So what will companies do to step up? The good companies, companies like BI, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, we before COVID, we uh, actually did revamp our total rewards uh, package. Uh, but things are different, and remote working is becoming much more negotiable uh, than it was before. But here's here's the benefit from a DEI perspective. In the past, you know, we would require many people to be at a corporate headquarter or location, and I truly think um, that proximity now is not going to be as crucial and that it will, by design, give us even more diversity of talent than we've ever had because people from all over uh, don't have to think about relocating uh, per se. Uh, They could probably endure a business trip a month or or two if if we ever travel again. Um, uh, So I think think there are some long-term benefits that will help companies really diversify the ranks um, and um, the build the pipeline in ways they haven't built talent pipelines. Um, I also think that the packages, I think it is going to have a little bit of a compensation impact because uh, people can choose to work in different states where uh, the taxes may be different to, um, or more lucrative for them. Um, and so we're looking at all of those things right now. Um, and that maybe, you know, everyone's on the same page. We're all competing for similar talent. Um, what's going to be the differentiator? So, you know, if company A offers remote working and company B does, what's the add on, you know, what's the sprinkle on the cone that's going to make me move. Uh, if I can get that from Jan, um, what is she offering me that Nancy isn't? So we are going to have to be a bit more creative. Um, and um, I think a bit more uh, intuitive uh, with the potential candidates and we'll probably be looking much more deeper into what really matters. Um, and I, I would say uh, in the next six to nine months, we'll. Uh, probably have a better sense uh, of what those changes might be. So interesting. And and I think you're spot on in the sense of understanding that um, when we think about, for example, month number one of COVID versus month number six of COVID, those are two dramatically distinct periods and different periods of time, only separated by a few months, right? And so I think that as we settle into 
um, you know, no matter if it's COVID 2.0 or how we think about, you know, the, the new normal, as many of us refer to it as, I do think that particularly for women, needs are going to shift and change in addition to ensuring that companies like yours are doing the right thing by listening and understanding that you're right, like the, the pressures put on women, no matter if you have zero kids at home or five or six kids at home, right? There's still additional pressures that women are taking on because, you know, we do hold many C-suite roles within the home. <laughs> Absolutely. And they're not you know, <laughs> somebody's got to, uh, somebody's got to do it. But, you know, um, I love the analogy you made about um, COVID, right? And a lot of people have said, we're all in the same boat. And, it, you know, I don't think we are. Mm -hmm. I think we're all in the same storm, but different boats. And some of us are navigating this in yachts. Some of us are navigating it in rowboats. Some of us don't even have a boat, right? Um, and I think it's important to know that um, this storm on a variety of levels, not just the pandemic, if you think about what are, what are the classic things we say when there are three life events going on, the human and the brain is usually in crisis mode. So we essentially have three major world events happening, notwithstanding our own issues personally, right? So if we look at the pandemic, we look at social injustice, and we look at global warming and what's happening with all the fires and the storms, we have that, but we haven't even come into our own home yet, right? Um, that's directing us. So we are, uh, I have never experienced this in my lifetime. I don't even think my parents, uh, you know, they grew up in the um, depression era, but I I don't, I think this is worse than the depression in many ways. Um, so it, it's a very tough time uh, oh. and resiliency is key. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, that actually is a perfect segue into my next question, which was around change and resiliency. <laughs> and, and for you personally, what does resiliency mean? Because we use that word a lot um, and we use, um, you know, I hear, you know, words like empathetic and, you know, um, and, you know, um, listening and, um, you know, transparency and, um, and so wondering, you know, from your perspective, what does resilience mean for you personally? And then how does that help to shape the work that you do in your own, in your own position? I mean, at, at the risk of sounding, uh, somewhat Pollyanna, um, never give up hope because I, I really do believe that things will change, maybe not tomorrow, but uh, they do change and things shift. So I, I certainly believe in that. I also am a, a believer if you fall off the horse, get right back on. Um, and uh, approach the fear, be courageous, and um, think about you know, what would happen if you didn't do that. Uh, and challenge yourself to go out of your comfort zone. Even if you don't feel like it, even have um, an accountability buddy, you know, somebody that could ping you or IM you and say, hey, did you get on your Peloton today? I didn't see you in the class, you know, or did you take a walk? Um, but hold yourself accountable to you. Uh, like, for example, this morning, I was like, eh, I don't know if I'm going to work out. And I'm, I'm usually an active exerciser. And I find myself like pushing myself even more. And I'm like, think about how lousy you're going to feel today if you don't do it. And I was like, ping, <laughs> just got right back to bed and, you know, went to do my exercise. So I think it's, it's having that discussion with yourself about what if I don't do that? And it's not so much about uh, the expectations of others. It's holding yourself accountable to uh, go through the storm, however that is, and don't give up because there is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not another train <laughs> coming on. And, um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Um, you know, I want to I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, a Harvard Business Review article that was written 18 years ago called Dear White Boss, oh, yeah. um, written by two individuals, two writers who recently 
were asked by Harvard Business Review again, what's changed in the last 18 years? And their response was literally not much. Yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on that um, in the ways in which we have made tremendous progress, particularly in the workplace, um, and then ways where we're still dramatically falling short. And do you think that COVID, because of everything that's come to light, in the sense of all the inequalities that are so blatantly in front of our face, do you think this will be a time for leaders to really, truly reach their own aha moments? Uh, absolutely. And I, I do agree with um uh, you know, again, my in my humble opinion, uh, I do agree with the writers of Dear White Boss. There, the that article uh, or that study that um, they put together really talks about those subtleties that are hard to measure, right? Uh, it's those little micro inequities or micro um, uh, aggressions or uh, these inequities that build up over time and erode a sense of confidence um, in the individual to want to stay with that company. And quite frankly, organizations have done uh, in in the past the the easy fixes. The you know yeah I can put more diversity on the slate. Sure I'm going to do that. But the real hard work is, is what we're experiencing now. It's the culture aspect. It's, it's not just the empathy. It's thinking about comments that one may make that could unintentionally offend someone. Like those classic, you know, I don't see color. Uh, I don't see gender, right? I don't see, how can you say that, right? <laughs> to some, and, and people think that by saying that, they, they're they saying a good thing. I think what's different now is the heightened awareness. Um, and it's not, and you know, 18 years ago, it was very much about um, getting people on board and, and uh, the majority, you know, I would say the majority of people get it. Um, there is, and unfortunately, you know, at very senior levels in our country, um, things are looked at very differently, but, I can honestly say that leaders in the business world see the value of empowering and enabling uh, people in ways they've never done before. So for sure, I'm committed that we will see um, a change. I think that it was unfortunate that the George Floyd event was that woke moment uh, for the world, uh, not just in the U.S., but um, the key is to sustain this momentum and to hold leaders accountable for the change and not to have check the box efforts or to throw money at organizations. But if you're going to throw money at an organization, have a scholarship where you can measure, um, you know, people coming through in your company. Um, don't just put money towards things or resources, make sure there are plans behind them. Uh, and I feel comfortable that, at, you know, at, at Beringer Ingelheim, we are looking at um, a long-term strategy. Of course, there are things, you know, that we can do in the short term, but this um, is a journey. And I've been doing this work for more than 25 years. Um, and this is the moment that you wait for in your career. And I resigned myself to the point that I would never see this, um, you know, perfect intersection come to life, but it has, and I'm seizing the opportunity now. I'm taking advantage of every possible angle I can to get people engaged. And it, it's the type of thing like, uh, uh, you know, when you, you bust up an anthill and the ants go scattering all over the place, this, um, I finally feel that the leaders have come out of their anthill, but we're trying to um, you know, get everyone mobilized in a unified way so we get the, the, the most traction rather than people going off into different directions, which requires a, a shift in, in our approach. Um, I so appreciate and thank you for sharing the idea of creating, um, creating ways to realize the value of the impact that you have with your money. Right. I love your cat in the background, by the oh, way. <laughs> that's, that's Minxie. She's, uh, 
she's um, she stepped in. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. No, she, I, I, she's adorable. <laughs> she's um, she doesn't normally do this, but today she's um, very. <laughs> you know, I I love all of the things that float around social media around you know like the you know, the, the personalities that come to life in your animals during, you know, during COVID when cats are like, when are they going to go back to the office? And dogs are like, I hope they never go back to the office. <laughs> the cats are like, get out of here. Do you know, it, it was a very interesting um, shift for her. Uh, when we were home, she hid, she, you know, because we invaded her space. Um, she <laughs> was so used to being alone. Now she won't leave us alone. So, um, but anyway. Hey, thank you, Jan. Uh, it was my distinct pleasure to be with you. Oh, no, this has been so enjoyable. And Nancy, we have so much more to talk about. I know that we're at the top of the hour, but would love to invite you back to continue the conversation. Um, because I think that, you know, in this space of how we think about equity, inclusion, and diversity, there's, there's going to be a lot of growth in this space. Um, and I think it's going to be really important to have insights from exceptional leaders like yourself who run these initiatives and, and departments and functions for companies that are really doing beautiful things to help us think about globally, what does it mean to be a part of a solution rather than waiting for something to happen on the back end? Um, this is time for our lightning round, which is my favorite favorite <laughs> round of questioning. Okay. Um, okay, number one, um, if 2020 were a year, how would you describe it in five words or less? I guess, wait, wait, let me fix that question. 2020 is a year. <laughs> How would you describe 2020 in five words or less? <laughs> it is truly a cluster of a world upside down. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. What advice would you give to your 85-year-old self today? Live life to the fullest. Don't postpone the things that you want to do um, and uh, stay healthy, uh, eat right and drink good wine. <laughs> Fabulous all the way around. And what are some of your favorite shows that you're binge watching right now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not good with titles, but um, uh, Little Fires Everywhere. Um, I've watched that. Um, the other one that I saw uh was about the uh the internet um with facebook and social uh, social dilemma social dilemma right uh let's see uh i i'm an avid pbs evening news watcher so uh i watch that every night i look forward to politics mondays and fridays uh to keep up with with things um let me see a couple of things on hulu oh i did see the, Mich uh, the michelle obama um, special boy, I miss her. And, um, let's see, I've watched, you know, uh, Ozarks and, um, you know, things of that sort. I'm not, uh, I can't remember if you mentioned some, I probably have seen them. Yeah, I want to ask you a question about little fires everywhere, because I think yeah. that that's so relevant to our <laughs> conversation today. Yeah. Um, so in what ways have, did the writers and directors and producers get it spot on? And in what ways have they failed from what you've seen so far? Well, uh, I really think the, um, the desire of um, the daughter to want to live in that very privileged life of what she thought was so much better than hers, when in fact... Her mother denounced that um, for a variety of reasons, had the money, but chose to not live that way, mm -hmm. um, but also saw the privilege that came with that and with with money and with those benefits and thought that life was better on the other side. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it was a lot of window dressing. Right. I, I don't want to spoil it for people, but um Lots of little fires everywhere. Um, and, and that's the best way to describe it. It is definitely riveting. And if you haven't read the book, I would suggest reading the book um, and the, um, you know, um, Washington, the uh, actor, right? Uh, she's amazing in, in the, uh, she, she puts, and Reese Witherspoon is just phenomenal. Yeah. And so I love Reese Witherspoon. Uh, I think she's such a versatile actor. So, yeah, uh, 
I think I think it just really highlighted privilege. It uncovered the LGBTQ aspects um, of New York in the 80s with artists um, and how um, the mother as an artist led her life. Um, it, 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 it was fascinating. To me. I think it's an interesting, um, interesting reflection on just motherhood generally as well in the sense of you know, the ways in which women will go to all lengths to protect what they deem to be important to them. So even if, even if there's such a short-sightedness or blindsidedness of then how it impacts everybody else around them as well. But yes. I thought that was a really interesting, and, and I don't have children, but I thought that that was a really interesting way in which the writers chose to depict, depict motherhood. Yeah, that I, you know, that's a great point. And I probably didn't even tap into that because I don't have children either. But, um, Except Minxie, she's the my furry child. <laughs> but I, I do think um, I do think it, it's it it is very powerful. It's it's worth a look see. Yeah, absolutely, Nancy. Thank you so much thank for you. being with us, and can't wait to host you again. Thanks everyone for staying with us. I'm Jan Marsha Doms, the Vice President of U.S. Development with Join Meshan. Check us out at joinmeshan.com to learn more about how you too can be a part of how we together revolutionize how professional women connect, engage, and do business together. Hello, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the bell to receive notifications of all of our content.